Hi, everybody, and welcome to City Beat. I'm your host, Nancy Byrne, and we are coming to you from the KCLV TV studio control room. I'm not wearing a mask because the public is not allowed in here, and my photographer, Steve Horlock, and I are at least six feet apart. Well, the city has just launched a brand new project aimed at attracting tourists and locals to areas of interest in our downtown area. Whatever your need may be from the medical district to the arts district, now you can track it down through a series of colorful banners and signs. Kicking it off, Restaurant Row. Looking for a place to park your car and hop from one eatery to another? Well, check out Restaurant Row at Carson Avenue. Easy to spot now thanks to these new banners and signs. Here in the Fremont East District, there are several restaurants all in about two blocks of Carson Avenue. You can start your day with a donut at Donut Bar or a smoothie at Juice Stars. Move on later in the day to some comfort food at Eat or get your taco fix at Madero Street Tacos. And finish off your culinary hop with cocktails and dinner at any of the other restaurants, Carson Kitchen, Downtown Terrace, Vegination, Macho Sushi, or 7th and Carson. Owner of 7th and Carson tells us this idea was born a few years ago out of a desire to have all businesses in the downtown area work as one to attract visitors and locals. Tony Shea had a vision of, you know, building a community and having everyone work together and, and have, a, have a situation where people can come downtown, park the car, walk around, get some food, be entertained, go see a show, and be, you know, kind of a, it's, it's like a community spirit. The idea got put on the back burner during some major construction projects in the area and then, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. But Liam Dwyer says the city gave the banners and signage the green light at the beginning of this year. He gives the city kudos for knowing this added touch of color and declaration of districts will make a big difference to downtown visitors. He particularly credits Mayor Carolyn Goodman and city manager Jorge Cervantes. So when he called a couple months ago, he said, listen, I need all the information. Let's get all this platform together so we can get it on the ground and ready for execution in the spring. Here we are. Spring has sprung. The patios are open. Downtown is beautiful. This project is part of the Downtown Master Plan Vision 2045. Other districts will be getting banners and signage soon. Those districts include Resort and Casino, Civic and Business, 18B Arts, Gateway, Symphony Park, Market, Fremont East, Design, Cashman, Historic West Side and Founders, and the Las Vegas Medical District. The stakeholders down here are expecting this small but vibrant change to bring people back to enjoying all the great things the heart of our city has to offer. People often say public and private entities don't work well together, but this small business owner believes that without the help of the city, state, and federal government, and without forward-thinking projects like the Downtown Master Plan, any hope of keeping the lights on during this pandemic would have been dimmed. If I wasn't assisted by the city, with some grants, with, by the state, with some federal disaster relief funds, and I got the PPP from the state. That all these things have helped me stay alive, keep my restaurant open, keep my employees on the ground, and put us in a situation where we can actually launch this platform today. There is no doubt the city of Las Vegas was hit harder than most cities because we rely so heavily on the entertainment and hospitality industries. But boy, our small business is really pulled together. That combined with some great grants and programs offered by the city of Las Vegas, a lot of people think we're going to be even stronger post-COVID-19 than we were before the pandemic. Speaking of bouncing back, you may have noticed a lot of traffic around the World Market Center. That's because thousands of people from the home and gift industry were in town for the annual market, Las Vegas market. And this year, something extra to celebrate. A ribbon was cut on the expo at World Market Center. It is a new 315,000 square foot facility that is meeting demand for convention and exhibit space in our downtown. It also marks the first step toward recovery since COVID-19 hit more than a year ago. City leaders joined the CEO of International Market Centers to celebrate the $103 million state-of-the-art center. This three-year project represents a $103.5 million investment, an investment in the city of Las Vegas. It delivers more than 315,000 square feet of exhibition space to downtown, a valuable and much needed diversification 
of the region's exhibition offering. Mayor Carolyn Goodman and Councilman Cedric Creer thanked international market centers for their partnership in this expo and said this will continue to diversify our economy and bring more people to the heart of Las Vegas. The statement for us to have this fabulous expo here, what it means to all those who come into town, the closeness of everything in the heart of the city besides being the place where all roads come together makes it absolutely nirvana for smaller conventions, design center, and everything that you're doing. It's gonna bring new people who have not been to downtown Las Vegas into our corridor to experience our hotels, our restaurants, our nightlife, our main street, of the bars and restaurants that are opening up. It's gonna generate a whole new generation of folk who are coming into downtown Las Vegas. Often when we hear about conventions in Las Vegas, we think about the Strip, but city leaders say this could be a game changer for conventions coming to downtown. You know, you might have thought the pandemic would have put the brakes on road construction, but actually quite the opposite is true. There are so many highway and surface road projects underway right now. We thought we'd sit down with the director of Public Works for two reasons, really, to give you an idea of areas you might want to steer clear of and also to let you know why when all the dust settles, it really will be worth it. I know, I know, it seems everywhere you turn, there are orange cones, construction equipment, and men and women in hard hats tearing up and rebuilding roads and highways. But look at it this way. These are the sights and sounds of jobs and improvements that even COVID-19 couldn't stop. Everyone thought that maybe with the COVID impacts to our community that road construction would have slowed down, but it was anything but. We actually had so many projects in the queue before COVID hit us that it was just timing that all of our projects were going under construction almost during the beginning of COVID and right through it. As the man in charge of infrastructure in the city of Las Vegas, Mike Jansen knows the progress of every project underway, and he says right now downtown is one of the hot spots for improvements. He went over several of the big ones with us, so we could see where they stand and what we can look forward to, starting with one that's hard to miss. The $125 million improvements to Las Vegas Boulevard between Sahara and St. Louis includes updating old sewer and water lines, widening the sidewalks, safety improvements, and overall beautification. When you think about some of the civil unrest that occurred with some protests and the COVID impacts, all the things that were going on, supplier challenges to try to get concrete materials, there were some delays, but we're literally on schedule. I spoke with our project manager today and she said we are right at 33% complete and it's a three year project, so we got two more years to go, but the contractor's making great progress. This section of Las Vegas Boulevard should be completed by the end of the year. Construction will continue up the boulevard to Stewart, wrapping up in April of 2023. Another big project is a partnership between the city and UNLV School of Medicine. Ground was broken on the school in October of 2020. The school is projected to be move-in ready by October of 2022. And it's the city's job to make sure everything around it is safe and beautiful. They're working on site to bring that beautiful building out of the ground and make it ready for the, all the new students. We're taking care of the street side, and so we're right on target with um, work on Shadow Lane and Pinto Lane, which surrounds the new medical school. And speaking of the surrounding area, $80 million will go into major improvements in the entire medical district, starting with Shadow Lane, then on to Pinto, then expanding to Charleston from Martin Luther King Boulevard to Rancho, then Rancho from the 95 to Sahara. But what all those projects are going to do, Nance, that $80 million investment is, it's going to create a unified campus infrastructure that's going to be comfortable for walking, comfortable for biking, good for driving. There'll be capacity improvements like bus turnouts, right turn lanes. There'll be mature shade trees. And one of the things we heard the most from the, all the business owners, all the students was, we want really good lighting. From the medical district to the arts district, this is another area that has already seen incredible improvements. The Main Street Improvement Project made this a place where locals and tourists wanted to live, play, and work. That's why so many restaurants, bars, and unique shops want to be here and continue to build and open, even during the pandemic. Now, more improvements are on the way. 
about a $40 million investment that we're doing in the Arts District. Uh, one project's gonna start in June on a street called Boulder Avenue. Shortly after that in July, we're gonna start a project on California where there's a whole host of restaurants that can't wait to see the nice shaded streets and, and the improved sidewalk zones. And then after those are done, we're gonna work on Casino Center, Colorado, and Wyoming. So that whole area is being transformed while we speak. As she were signed, the Arts District is thriving. Jansen says not enough parking to accommodate the crowds. Something he says will be remedied. As a short-term relief, many parallel parking spots are being replaced with angled parking, doubling the spots. A parking garage is on the horizon. We saw the incredible installation of the Welcome to Downtown Arches over Las Vegas Boulevard recently. Well, next, a pedestrian bridge that will be almost as spectacular, offering efficiency, safety, and beauty. Instead of four separate pedestrian bridges, the standard to the south, we're doing one bridge, a circular bridge, that when you go up on top of that bridge, if your destination is whatever corner, you'll be able to get there so much shorter than you would if you had the other style. When it's all said and done, I think it's gonna be a work of art in and of itself. And what's really cool about it, that rendering that I sent you, um, you can see how popular it might be for people to get selfie photos of the arch because at the top of that bridge, you have a straight shot to the arch. So the next time you're traveling around downtown Las Vegas and feel inconvenienced by yet another road construction project, just remember it wasn't too long ago when buildings stopped and construction equipment sat idle during the recession. So maybe this dust isn't so bad after all. A big thank you to Mike Jansen for always making himself available to keep us up to date on the projects around the city. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, did you know there is a national Save a Horse Day? Well, there is, and when we come back, we're going to introduce you to some beautiful horses who narrowly escaped death and were rescued and are now living the high life. Drop that baby. <laughs> People think I'm trash, but they're wrong. Today I'm just an aluminum can, but one day I could be a stadium. Welcome back to City Beat from the KCLV TV studios. When you hear the term first responders, you might picture firefighters tackling a house fire or police pulling up to a crime or car accident. But the real first first responders are the men and women of public safety telecommunications, often referred to as dispatchers. They are the ones that offer that calm and helpful voice on the other end of the line when anyone calls for help. We are just coming off a week across the nation of honoring these workers, so we thought we'd pay homage to the ones here in Las Vegas by delivering to you a very important message. Whenever there is any type of fire, police, or medical emergency, we know our first responders are going to get there and get there quickly. But they don't just roll out on these incidents on their own. They respond after calls for help come into this call center, staffed by the emergency communication specialists. Our comm specialists and everyone in our dispatch center is crucial to the overall package of emergency response. They are the first first responders. Our call center is located at Las Vegas Fire and Rescue Station 1, one of the busiest fire stations in the country. It receives more than 300,000 calls a year, and it is the dispatch center not only for Las Vegas, but North Las Vegas and Clark County, including some of the more remote areas like Mount Charleston and Moapa. So it might surprise you to hear that as busy as they are with real emergencies, it is not unusual for them to get calls that, frankly, don't even resemble an urgency. I will tell you, it actually happens. The drive through wrong order has absolutely happened. I'm locked out of my house. I'm not talking about locked out of my house. You have an infant on the other side of the door. I'm talking about I lost my keys. Or, I mean, there's any number of incidents that the reasonable person would not conclude is a uh, reason to call 911 that they do. So we, we definitely want people to use 311. 
311 was established to handle something that might be important or suspicious but does not qualify as an emergency. According to Fire Chief Jeff Buchanan, here is the rule of thumb for picking up the phone and calling 911. Only call 911 if it's absolutely dangerous, life-threatening, someone is significantly hurt or significantly ill. For anything else, 311 is your better choice. This is not simply because those answering the calls don't want to be bothered with your lost keys. It is to prevent lost lives. The longer it takes for an, a response to arrive for a medical call, uh, per se, contributes to brain death and, and heart death. So if someone's in cardiac respiratory arrest, someone's in stroke, the longer it takes for medical intervention to get there, uh, the, the greater likelihood of a bad outcome. Same with a fire. The longer it takes for units to get there, 15 seconds, just hold your breath for 15 seconds. It, it's uncomfortable. The speed of fire moves fast in 15 seconds. So if a caller is taking up one of our dispatchers time on a call that isn't necessary for even 15 seconds, it means they can't appropriately dispatch for someone else who's certainly waiting in our queue. Those who answer these calls are unsung heroes who save lives every day behind the scenes. We can help them by making sure our call to them is truly an emergency. They experience a lot of the same things that police officers and firefighters experience out in the field. Police officers and firefighters actually see it. All of our comm specialists, our dispatchers, are hearing it. We're really proud of them. They're very much a part of the first response and providing the community with the care that they need. They're actually the first stop. Here are some tips if you need to call 911. First and foremost, try to stay calm. Know your location and the number you're calling from. Wait for the call taker to ask questions and then answer as clearly and calmly as you can. Let the person answering your call guide the conversation and follow any directions they give you. So you might be asking, well, what does warrant a call to 311? So I'll give you an example of a time that I did. I was out walking my dog and came across a house in our neighborhood. The garage door was partially open and there was a lot of glass in the driveway. So I wasn't really witnessing a crime or an accident, but it just didn't feel right. So I called 311 and gave them the address and let them determine whether or not it was urgent. Believe me, if they determine it's an emergency, they will treat it as one. Well, as we said, we just got done celebrating our dispatch. Dispatchers, but did you know that there is a day set aside in our nation to help or save a horse? Well, there is. It is April 26th, and we thought we would celebrate by introducing you to a group of people who don't just rescue horses. They get them healthy emotionally and physically and then give them a purpose. Out here in the great northwest part of Las Vegas, this ranch is home to 20 horses of all breeds and sizes, from huge Belgians, one weighing in at 2,500 pounds, to ponies, and just about everything in between. These are the horses of Gladius the Show, a beautiful equestrian production that performs all over the country. But these horses have something in common aside from the show. Nearly all of them have been rescued in one way or another. Here is the story behind the four Norwegian fjords on the ranch. They were all snatched up by the owners of Gladius just before being put to death. They were adopted on two separate occasions, um, but they were all four in kill pens headed to the horse slaughter and um, they were pulled out by two different rescue organizations. One of the rescues was in here in Nevada in Mesquite, and the other one is the um, Norwegian Fjord Horse Rescue Network. And once we contacted them, they were able to get us adopting them. Alethea Shelton, who is part owner and one of the performers, says all four were in bad shape, two emotionally and two physically. This horse is Floki. He's, he's one of the ones that was most recently rescued, and he um, is the one that's the most skeptical of people. So he's been taking a while to just get humanized. So we spend a lot of time um, just kind of having him in hand and hanging out with him, and I do a lot of work with him on the ground to build uh, some trust so he starts to trust us. Floki was adopted at the same time and basically in the same condition as Thor. They were both like weight wise they looked okay but emotionally they were really distressed he had his partner for life separated from him so he was very stressed out and had separation anxiety and 
Um, just emotionally, they were not in good shape at all. Eric Matanovich, the other owner of the show, has been riding horses since he was six years old and says he's never seen horses as emaciated as the other two rescues, Foya and Balder. Um, so yeah, when we got him, he was a skeleton. He, they, I don't know why someone didn't feed him for so long, and but whatever it was, he was completely malnourished. Uh, he was always really cuddly and friendly. Like he never, there wasn't that, the emotional side of it. But we had, when we got him, we had to feed him just nonstop for about three months just to get them to where they weren't just skin and bone anymore. It would be much easier and a lot less time consuming to get horses that are already trained to be ridden and ready to learn to be part of the show. But the performers in this show are not only highly skilled vaulters and aerialists, they are first and foremost animal lovers and advocates for rescuing these magnificent creatures from harm or death. So to them, it's worth the extra work and patience. Yeah, so the first the first thing we do is just try to learn the horse, figure out what, what it's issues are, what it's happy with. And with that, that's also like with the show, we have a lot of different things that the horses can do. And so we'll kind of play with different stuff and see what they like and what they don't like. Some horses are really happy to do one thing and not so happy about another. And one of the great things is we have so much stuff and such a diverse amount of horses that we're really able to give them the ability to do what they want to do. Every horse is going to take patience and then some take more patience than others. Um, but we're, we're putting a lot of time and energy into rehabbing them and giving them trust and giving them a life with a job, which horses like to have that. Alethea says Floki has come a long way from not even wanting to be near a human, but he will eventually be one of the chariot pulling horses that you see in the show. If you have any doubt they'll get him to that point, just take a look at Gladius the show and keep in mind nearly every one of these horses came to the ranch needing a lot of extra love and patience to get them where they are today. Fortunately, there is no shortage of love or patience in these owners and performers. That was clear when I asked Alethea and Eric why they rescued these gentle giants. It just adds to it, you know, just gives us a little more connection with the horse. But just something, something to do for them helps. Are you emotional? Me? Yes. In general? No. no. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, we do it for the for the horses. We want to save them. You know, we don't. We don't like to see animals suffering, and it's just a win-win situation. When you can pull an animal out of a situation like that, it just makes you feel really good. <laughs> and they give us lots of love, so. I actually got choked up when I watched how emotional they get when they talk about those horses. But aside from being great people, they are all great athletes. Everyone in that show has competed either nationally or internationally as vaulters and aerialists. You can learn more about all of the horses and find out where Gladius the Show will be performing here and all over the country by going to GladiusTheShow.net. Well, we've been waiting, and just in time for the hot summer months, Pavilion Pool is reopening. Sue Levitt was there for the grand opening. Kids are excited today as Pavilion Pool reopens to the public. What a great day. We get to cut a ribbon on this brand new renovated pool. and But the best part is you all get hot dogs and cookies. Thank you to the councilwoman. Pavilion Pool has been closed for some time for repairs and renovations that include replastering the pool, painting the exterior of the building, and installing a new diving board. We're so excited today because we have the grand opening over here at our pool at Veterans Memorial. And we were so fortunate to have the capital improvement money to replaster this pool that is the most utilized pool in the Las Vegas Valley. Along with offering open swim sessions, there's also areas for lap swimming, exercise and log rolling classes, and swim and dive lessons are all offered at the pool. Pavilion Pool is also home to the Sandpiper swim team and the Nevada Desert Mermaid synchronized swimmers who train regularly here. Today, the Desert Mermaids are putting on a show to celebrate the grand reopening. You were here 
because this is something after we were shut down with COVID, kids are able to go back and go swimming and have that, that activity in the summer coming up in the spring. All year round, this pool is utilized. The cost for kids ages four to 17 and those 50 and older is $2. Pool use is free for kids age three and younger. Adults age 18 to 49 will pay $3. And there's also monthly three month and six month passes available. The city is, of course, following all of the COVID-19 safety measures. If you would like more information on pull hours or classes offered, you can call 229-PLAY or go ahead and visit our website. We look forward to bringing you more ways to discover the fun as we continue to open our pools, parks, and community centers safely. Thank you, Sue Levitt, for that story. Speaking of Sue Levitt, our video services department was recently asked to highlight some of the science and technology aspects of what we do here for the city. Sue Levitt gives us a behind the scenes look at KCLV TV. Stand by for the open. We're in. Hello everyone and thanks for joining us for Access City Council. We want to make sure that government connects with the people and we want to do it in a way that's convenient for them. Well, most everyone has a television, so we're going to provide programming from the city that probably other television stations are not going to provide. David Riggleman is the City of Las Vegas Communications Director and also hosts Access City Council, one of the shows recorded here in the KCLV studio and featured on Channel 2. On Access City Council, each of the council members from the various wards, one through six, talk about the things that are going on in the ward, things that have happened, things that are upcoming. And again, it's very specific to neighborhoods. Access City Council airs weekly and is just one of the many original programs produced and aired on Channel 2. KCLV is also the platform for City Beat, Trending Vegas, and Hello Mayor. City Beat explores the unique events and stories that are a part of our community. And you can get your social media fix from watching Trending Vegas as we show you what's trending and how this impacts your life. On Hello Mayor, Mayor Carolyn Goodman takes an in-depth look at issues, history, and what makes our community a world-class city. We're very proud of our facility, our TV studio here at uh, the city. The thing of it is, we've been on the air for about 20 years, now 21 years, it's hard to believe. Three, two, Hello everyone, I'm Sue Levitt. We're glad you can join us for the City News Update. Our state-of-the-art facility and equipment allows us to deliver messages live via satellite uplink. And when COVID hit our city, we had the ability to begin delivering daily newscasts to our viewers, keeping residents updated and informed on important information that was changing daily. We saw that there was a huge demand for information and accurate information. Our website had about a million and a half hits. People were looking for information about the pandemic and what was true and what wasn't. The TV station was the same thing. We were providing information on TV every day about unemployment benefits and getting vaccinations, getting tested, all the things that people were looking to find out. And we knew that they, they were trying to find that information in a place they could trust and we wanted to make sure that we were there for that. Good morning, everyone. The March 3rd, 2021 meeting of the City Council is called to order. Our council chambers is equipped with all of the technology needed to enable us to broadcast our council and planning meetings live to the public. And the mayor delivers her annual State of the City address right here from our chambers, live to viewers at home. People watch TV and they think, well, it's just people sitting in front of a camera talking. But it's far more than that, very technical. Uh, if you have a technical bent, if you're interested in science, uh, television is a certain, certainly a great avenue because the things that you're gonna learn on a technical basis are always applied in a television station. So now you know we not only air those important meetings gavel to gavel, we're a little more than that. We are social media and we are Emmy Award winning original programming. Thank you, Sue Levitt, for that behind the scenes look. That does it for the City Beat. We'll see you next time around.